Book 4, Chapter 14, A Message from Prison It was whilst he was preaching in the vicinity of Nain that John the Baptist, languishing in the fortress prison above the Dead Sea, sent two of his disciples to Jesus to ask the unexpected question, Art thou he who should come, or look we for another? Much has been said and written concerning what many consider to be an evidence of the Baptist's faltering faith. Allowances are made, mitigating circumstances are urged. The privations of prison life have been emphasised. It has been suggested that the reports that Jesus had been feasting with publicans and sinners and refusing to allow his disciples to fast had created a germ of doubt which developed rapidly in the loneliness of the prison cell. It has been said that John's question did not betray more than a need for assurance in view of the failure of the Messiah to manifest his power in establishing the kingdom. But is there any evidence that John doubted at all? Certainly it would have been a reversal of all that we know of his character. The privations of prison can hardly be urged against a man who, from his earliest days, had known nothing but the hardships of the wilderness. The effects of loneliness cannot be deplored when they refer to one who had spent years of lonely meditation far from the haunts of men, waiting for the day when his active work would begin. Moreover, the reluctance of Herod Antipas to have him beheaded, and the facilities he was allowed for converse with his disciples, suggests that John may have had some relief from the solitary confinement to which he was committed. Whilst we may say that, knowing human nature, this was yet possible, we also have to face the fact that John's doubt would have been a betrayal of his divine calling. He had been given the Holy Spirit from his birth. His whole mission was guided by God's power. It was thus that he had departed into the deserts. It was thus that he knew when the time had come for him to lift up his voice and call the multitudes to him. Above all, it was in this way, by his own acknowledgement, that he recognised the Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit he knew that his work would only be successfully accomplished when his influence waned before the greater light of the Messiah, whose path he prepared. And does not this last consideration give us the clue to the real meaning of that journey which two of John's disciples undertook? John no longer needed or desired disciples. His work was finished. Any who clung to him in spite of his protestations were an embarrassment to him. Yet there were those who did cling. They remained faithful to him even after he had been carried away to the confinement of Machaerus. They had no intention of leaving him to join the disciples of Jesus. There is evidence that the Pharisees had seized the opportunity of antagonizing some of them against Jesus. Doubtless John had finally persuaded most of his followers to leave him and go to Jesus, but some were stubborn to the end and would not be persuaded that Jesus was the Christ. Is it not possible that John, realising the temper of these two men, decided to allow Jesus to convince them himself by his works? Alone they would never have gone to him. But armed with a commission they went obediently enough. John, obeying the Lord's precept to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves, had probably sent them to examine the claims of Jesus and come within his influence, knowing that Jesus would understand his motive and convince them. That Jesus responded is evident from Luke's account. 
and in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus sent the two back to John with a parting message meant not for the prisoner, but for them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. We can imagine the two very thoughtful disciples making their long journey southeastwards. And when finally they arrived and recounted to John all that Jesus had done, can we not hear the voice of the austere prophet still strong and resolute? Now will ye not believe him? If indeed he ever saw them again, for the end was at hand. But we may hope that they were among the many blind whom Jesus healed. Thus we may believe that the greatest prophet went to his death, not saddened by doubts which could only detract from his greatness, but with a last faithful effort to fulfil his vocation of directing men to the Messiah. When the messengers had left, Jesus turned to the multitudes and spoke about John, it is immediately evident that his words were not about one who was offended in him, but one who believed through persecution, imprisonment, and death. What went he out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? No. John had not been shaken by the wind of persecution. Did you expect to see a man clothed in soft raiment? He had every right to it. He could have lived delicately. No. They went out to see a prophet. But he was much more than a prophet. The function of the prophet was to announce God's purpose. John had been raised up to introduce God's Son. No greater work could have been assigned to mortal man. No greater man had been born of women. But the work of the Son was to prepare the world for the kingdom of God. And great as John was, the humblest place in the kingdom would represent something greater than anything John could see or know in his mortal life. With wonderful humility, Jesus beckons John to his side as one like him, who through the ages that had passed was destined to come, and like him was to suffer rejection. The kingdom of heaven, symbolized alike in the precursor and the Messiah, was to suffer violence. Both were to be taken by force. The publicans had responded to God's counsel by believing John's message and submitting to his baptism. The Pharisees and the lawyers, by refusing to accept the teaching and the baptism of the prophet, had rejected God. But in that very act they had condemned themselves. Jesus turned upon them now. How shall I describe you? You are like willful, peevish children who have come out into the marketplace to play. When your friends prepared to dance, you refuse, and when they try to accommodate you by playing at funerals, you are just as sulky and stubborn. Your whole life professes to be a dedication to God, but when he sends his ascetic wilderness prophet, you say he hath a devil, and when the Son himself appears in humble fellowship with men, your verdict is, Behold a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. The religious leaders had brought condemnation not only upon themselves, but also upon those they led. Out of sympathy with the prophets of God, satisfied only with themselves, they had tainted their generation with their conceit. But the sombreness of the picture is not unrelieved. A study of God's ways teaches us always to look keenly upon the little point of light which glimmers in the darkness. At last God's light will flood the world. Around him were the twelve, 
men who knew the temper of the sea and the changing moods of the sky, but who lacked careful tuition, the gentle art of intrigue and the polemics of domination. To them the Saviour had not come in vain. Their comprehension of his words was delayed, like the gradual summer days creeping over the slopes of the lakeside hills. But he spoke in a language they understood, and they responded. They had recognised the wisdom of God in the austerity of John, and they were growing to learn it in all its wonders in the companionship of the one who condescended to the table of publicans and sinners. The impressive sophistries, the rapier thrusts, the sparkling wit of the wise of that generation has long since passed into the limbo of forgotten things. The staunch loyalty of the fishermen swept on under the impulse of the swiftly moving drama to unshakable conviction glows today, drawing men through severe strains and heart-searching from darkness into its eternal light. Chapter 15 Simon the Pharisee Still journeying through Galilee in the company of his disciples, and followed by thronging multitudes, Jesus received an invitation to dine at a Pharisee's house. Simon, not to be confused with the leper at Bethany many miles to the south, had his reasons for inviting Jesus. His cool reception of his guests suggests curiosity rather than homage. But although he knew both the motive and the heart which inspired it, the one who ate with publicans and sinners was equally willing to accept the hospitality of those whom men esteemed greater. His message of salvation was offered to all. It was man's individual response, not his social state, that determined whether he should enter the kingdom. Only the complete inability of the majority of the rich and the self-righteous to realise their poverty and pride had finally driven Christ into the company of those who recognised their need. The meal was interrupted by what must have been an unprecedented outrage to the astounded Simon. A shadow flitted across the threshold as a woman came swiftly into the room, approached the reclining Jesus from behind, and fell at his feet in an abandonment of grief. Pitifully she wept. The hot tears coursed down her pale, suffering face and dropped on his unburdened feet. She wiped them away with her abundant hair, covering his feet with kisses. We have no record of the events which led this harlot into the Pharisee's house. It would have been no surprise to see her prostrate herself before him in the streets of the city, or even in the houses of the publicans. But that she should thus invade the privacy of the austere Pharisee, whom she had so much reason to fear, seems to demand our attention. It is obvious that she was moved by an overpowering sense of urgency. She must see Jesus now, wherever he was. That her inquiries led her to the Pharisee's house mattered not at all. What lay behind the urgency, those hot tears, those passionate kisses? Had not the Lamb of God entered into the kingdom of sin and won an overwhelming victory? It may have been that, for idle or evil reasons, she had mingled with the crowd that pressed about Jesus. She had probably watched as one poor victim of disease after another was transformed into radiant health under the loving touch. He had spoken of the beautiful things of life and God's way of holiness, until she had burned with shame. Perhaps he had raised his head and looked into her eyes. 
She would defy him for a time. All the barriers go up to protect her sin from his penetrating gaze. But not for long. Soon, like her mother Eve, she would be conscious only of her nakedness and her desire to hide. Jesus had gone his way. The multitudes had dispersed. The woman had tried to forget, but she knew she never would. His love had begun a fire in her soul that no rebellious tears could quench. It went on burning away her sin. But when the fire had consumed all the sin, the degradation and the shame, something sparkled in the blackened ruin, something too small for her heart to recognise, but it grew apace, it demanded recognition, it roused her from her prostration and drove her to Jesus. It was only when she kissed the feet that were damp with her tears that she knew it was love, love too great to define. With her tears and her hair and her hands, she was able to give it expression and ease her heart of something too big to carry far. But what could Simon know of all this? He could only see the external and translate it in terms of the convention. Oh, Simon, blind, pathetic Simon, Simon of every age, can you not see that you must do more than invite the Saviour into your house? He must be welcomed into your heart. It will only be when you have felt the pain of the blows and the scorchings of the fires which his coming brings that you will understand the grief of that woman lying at his feet. Then and only then you will see the wonder of the love which has elevated her. Then you will see why, whilst you were conspiring the death of the Saviour of the world, a woman stood in the garden at the dawn of day, filled with a love stronger than death. Recovering from his shocked surprise, Simon suddenly saw in the situation an answer to his doubts concerning Christ. If he were indeed the Messiah, he would recognise at once the identity of this woman and would drive her away. That he failed to do so was convincing evidence of the falsity of his claims. How wrong Simon was! Little did he suspect that Jesus not only knew all about the woman, but knew also the intimate thoughts which were even now passing through his mind. Simon had a lesson to learn. If he received it, his pride would be badly shaken. He would have rents torn in his cloak of righteousness. Yet who he would be able to begin a new life, which would put to shame the arrogant smugness of his false piety. Simon, I have something to say to thee. Master, he said, speak. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence, the other fifty. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Which of them will love him most? Simon replied, He, I suppose, to whom he forgave most. Thou hast rightly judged. Then, turning for the first time to the woman, he brought home the lesson to Simon. Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time that I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, 
but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Then addressing the woman, he said, Thy sins are forgiven. Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. In using his illustration, Jesus had also used Simon's estimate of the relative need of forgiveness between himself and the woman. He did not necessarily endorse it. Indeed, some of his subsequent parables show that it was at least possible that in his sight it was the woman who owed the fifty pence and Simon who owed the five hundred. Because the woman knew the depravity of her sin and had felt the grace of forgiveness, she had loved deeply. It was because Simon thought he had so little to forgive that he loved little. It is only when we take off the outer garments of hypocrisy and contemplate the majesty of God and his attributes shining forth in the character of Jesus that we begin to form a true estimate of our indebtedness. It is only then that the fifty pence will change to five hundred and the lip service will be transformed into a deep devotion which leads us with tear-filled hearts to the shadow of the cross. Thus we have this moving account of the first sin burdened penitent laying her load at the feet of Jesus and going away with peace in her heart and love surging through her whole being. She was the first of a multitude whose conscience has been stirred and whose eyes have been opened by the purity and love of the noble figure who trod the hills of Galilee as the messenger of the covenant. In remorse and gratitude they have sought him out and oblivious of the supercilious glances of their fellows they have demonstrated their affection. By some strange alchemy their load of sin and care has mingled with the tears and with the ointment, and they have gone on their way in peace and joy, desiring only fresh opportunities to manifest their new-found love.